this, this, this very special panel of um, winners and people involved in the debut prize in, in Russia. Um, uh, John Narens, the head of Kauza Artyom, who brought the, who organized this event, and they, uh, there's a tour, there. they spoke at the New York Public Library uh, uh, this weekend, and will be at Harvard this week? Yeah, on Wednesday. On Wednesday. Um, uh, has, has organized a great, uh, a great organization, Kauza Artyom in New York, which supports and uh, organizes artistic events in the city, and it's a real pleasure for us to work with him on this. We actually did a a, a prelude to this last year uh, in New York City at my apartment, and it was an amazing evening with some of the same people. Um, just a couple of, of, of announcements, because I'll let him do most of the introductions. Uh, there are three books that are going to be available for sale afterwards um, for anyone who'd like to buy them. Two of the collections of, of writing from people, winners of the debut prize uh, in, in Russia. Um, and uh, I have the Squaring the Circle one, which I can recommend. And then also uh, the novel, uh, winner of the Russian Booker Prize by Olga Slavdikova, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who's here, who's um, uh, been one of the patrons of the, and judges of the, um, of the debut prize. Um, and uh, it's a real pleasure to have her and the rest of the winners of the debut prize here at Bard. Uh, it's a real treat for us, and without taking away too much time. One, one last note. Um, Afterwards, there'll be a chance to buy some books. There'll be questions about both literature, but also about anything else you want to know about Russia and politics, anything else you want to talk about. But afterwards, there's going to be a reception with dinner uh, for all of you. You're all invited at the RN Center uh, down on Annandale Road. And so if you'd like to come, um, please make your way down there at about 8 o'clock, 8.15, uh, for, for dinner um, at, at the center, uh, where you can continue the conversation. So thank you very much and John Narrens. And can I, I actually need to book back because yes. we're going to read from one of these. Uh, welcome, Roger, thank you so much. Uh, we're thrilled to be here. Uh, a little bit very briefly about our, organiza our organization. Causa Artium uh, was founded by uh, two of us as people who are involved in the arts. As uh, I'm involved in literature as a writer and as a, as a critic. And Elena Sarni, the co-founder who's sitting right here, who's a, a wonderful artist. And um, uh, we do all sorts of things in the, in, in the arts that include uh, th things like this, literary events. We have uh, artistic uh, events and, and um, uh, uh, concerts and all sorts of performances. We also uh, have projects that are in uh, literary and art uh, criticism and scholarship. There's, uh, we're making a great database for uh, information about the arts, uh, Russian art of the second half of the 20th century, uh, second half of the 20th century, uh, Soviet art, the unofficial art, the, the, the art of, of the opposition, where we're interviewing th thousands and thousands of taped hours of uh, interviews with the participants and the, and, the, and the witnesses, and it gets turned into this uh, trackable database. You can look anything up. It's, it's, it's interesting stuff. So, um, and in June, we're also having a festival of, of Russian arts in New York, which will involve some of the writers here, um, and much, much more. And it's an amazing thing that New York actually doesn't have a serious Russian arts festival. Um, this program we're doing together with the Davy Prize Foundation. Uh, it's really important, we feel, to bring Russian literature of this new generation, of the youngest generation that's now writing and, and taking their place on the stage in Russia, uh, for any number of reasons. The most obvious reason is that there's a generational uh, change taking place, and the people who are now coming to the fore are people who are generally might at best have childhood, very young childhood recollections of anything that really had to do with the Soviet Union. The previous two generations, the, the last Soviet generation, the Perestroika generation, we could call them, and the first post-Soviet generation, were united by a single task. And that task was to somehow account for and cope with the legacy of the Soviet 20th century. What's amazing is how quickly Russia has moved ahead, and things tend to change there incredibly rapidly. And they've gone through the period where that, that was their main goal of dealing with this, through a period of, all right, that's moved off, we don't have to talk about it anymore into the point where it's so much become a matter of history that it's treated as this interesting, distant thing, that, it's, they, 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 that it, it becomes even a matter of kitsch for them. So um, it, 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 you'll see this in some of the things that are actually read today, and there's a lot to say about them. But it, in, their world is different, and their concerns are different, and their worries are different. And 
Russia is still at the same, for all that we somehow have this sense, I have a sense that American culture since the end of the Cold War has this notion that, all right, that's over, done with Russia, finish with that. Meanwhile, it's still one of the world's great cultures and it's still one of the world's great powers as, as uh, sometimes when things begin to go slightly wrong, people remember in the State Department. So I think there's a lot of reason that, uh, to, to, to want to know them and to want to understand them. And I think that it's important, that we, I think we don't. I think in a certain sense our notion of what, have, of what Russia is like is, is a generation behind. Um, and at the same time, this is true for their generation in general and it's true for their generation in literature, which is also in, way, in important ways very different from the literature of the previous two generations. And that's something you might want to ask them about when we get to questions and answers. Uh, and they have a lot of interesting things to say about that. Um, so in short, that's this program. It's an ongoing program to bring people together with the debut prize, winners and, and finalists of the debut prize here to America to introduce us to something which I think is a very important phenomenon, both socially and literarily. Um, uh, the, all right. Let me then uh, introduce the people we've brought here today, and in particular, uh, then Olga Slavnikov, who is the, the, the director of the debut prize, will say a few words. Uh, so, Ol Ol Olga, Slavnikov, Olga Slavnikov is one of Russia's best known and most important novelists today in Russia. And uh, she also is the director of the debut prize, and she has been for the beginning, the debut prize has been around for, for, for over a decade now, and it's become one of Russia's most important prizes. Um, we have brought four young writers from the prize. Dmitry Biryukov. Uh, why don't we do this? Let them say a few words about them. Can I ask how many people here speak Russian to some extent? Okay. Ну, замечательно, отлично. Но все-таки недостаточно, чтобы не нужно было перевод. Okay. So, um, why don't I do this? And each of them say a few words about themselves, and then Olga will speak a bit about the prize. Ну, скажите, каждый просто несколько слов о себе. Здравствуйте, меня зовут Дмитрий Бирюков. Я родился в Новосибирске, в Сибири. Hello, my name is Dmitry Birukov. Uh, I was born in Novosibirsk in Siberia. Несколько лет я жил в Москве, а теперь вернулся в свой родной город. He lived for a few years in Moscow, but has returned to his, his uh, native, native city. Я хочу сказать, что начал писать серьезно писать именно благодаря тому, что узнал о существовании премии дебют. Um, and he, what he wants to say is that he actually began to write seriously to write specific, specifically when and because he heard of the debut prize. Uh, <laughs> Что-то писал я всегда с раннего детства. Я любил читать. He had always been writing things and he loved to read and he, and he, and he had written things to some extent since he was a kid. Но у меня было такое представление о литературе как о чем-то завершенном, о том, что все писатели какие-то взрослые, старые или уже умершие. And but, but he had this notion of literature is something that was it's sort of like a completed, already existing thing, uh, something done by the writers who had already been around, already died. И вдруг я увидел рекламный ролик премии дебют о том, что объявляется конкурс для молодых авторов, и я понял, что значит литература существует. But one day he saw a video clip where talking, announcing that the debut prize was being held and that there was a there was a prize for young authors, and he suddenly realized, wait a minute, literature is actually alive; it's actually happening. А потом в интернете я увидел сайт премии дебют, где были выложены тексты некоторых финалистов, и я понял, что да, это настоящая литература, и, и, и решил, что пора бы уже самому писать более серьезно. Добрый день, спасибо всем, кто пришел. Меня зовут Ольга Славникова. Я уже не молодой писатель, я пожилой писатель. Good evening. Her name. My name is Olga Slavnikova. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. She says she's 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 not one of the young writers. She's a middle middle age writer. 
я помню, как русская литература в годы перестройки сначала была на гребне интереса, а потом вдруг стала никому не нужна. And she remembers the development of, of, of how these things happen, how back in the perestroika era, epoch, there was this, 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 the crest of the wave of interest in literature, and then, there was, and then it seemed to just disappear. She was working at that time there's a, uh, in a literary journal called Ural, in the, the Ural Mountain uh, Region. It's it's it's, a, it's one of the what they call the thick journals, the literary journals, and there was a point there where the 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 run of the journal went up, of course, two hundred thousand copies, which for a regional literary journal is ridiculous, and then it fell to virtually nothing. Книжный рынок дал дорогу всякому литературному мусору, тому что называется трэш. Серьезная литература была практически не востребована. The The, 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 the market, the literary market, the book market, uh, opened the way for, the, for a mass of, of literary, essentially, garbage, um, which you can, in, in Soviet times it wasn't, wasn't that easy to do that. Anyway, for this whole bunch of literary garbage and that serious literature uh, fell by the wayside. She had by this point already become the finalist for the Booker Prize, Russia's most important literary prize, for her first novel, which was called A Dragonfly, a Dragonfly Enlarged to the Size of a Dog. Um, so, so her literary career was doing all right, but she suddenly realized that she was risking becoming essentially the hero of Bradbury's story, The Last Man Alive on Mars. I could be that it's always dangerous when you get to reverse translating of titles of things in English. Ну и в общем, когда мне предложили работу, когда фонд поколения, это такой благотворительный фонд, основал эту премию, предложили мне работу директора премии, поняла, что это как раз мое дело. And then one day she was offered this position to direct the debut prize by the Generation Foundation, which is it's it's a charitable foundation that 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 backs the prize. Um, she realized that that was her calling. Мне оказалось, что это очень благодарное занятие, потому что вот это новое поколение, которое сейчас идет в русскую литературу, оно действительно уникально талантливо. And it turns out it's, it's really rewarding work because this new generation, which you're going to be hearing from today, these writers of this generation are really unusual, anomalously talented. И вот уже 12 год я занимаюсь премией дебют, и в общем у нас uh, сформировалось целое поколение, которое так и называют поколением дебют. She's been doing this for 12 years now, and there's already a, a generation of writers who they actually are, they're referred to sometimes <coughs> as the debut generation. The oldest uh, debut prize participants, recipients, are about 36 now, and in the Ru Russian literary life, you pretty much can't find a single known significant writer um, in that age category who hasn't gone through the debut prize, who wasn't a recipient to finals for the debut prize. And so, as you'll, as you'll hear, these, um, these young writers have actually triumphed in a, in a truly enormous literary, com enormous literary competition, and, and how enormous you'll hear in a minute. And so she, she's, she's very glad to have the opportunity to bring them here to you. Um, Okay. Thank you. My name is Alisa Ganiva. Uh, during the last several years, I live in Moscow and work as a literary critic and uh, essay writer and so on. Uh, but initially, I'm from Caucasus. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's south of Russia between Black and Caspian Sea, and I'm from a small, very heterogeneous, and very multinational republic called Dagestan, where now there are, there are lots of painful problems now. Uh, so uh, there was established a, good, uh, a group of young people who believe that uh, independent Islamic State will solve the problems of uh, corruption, police lawlessness and uh, so on. And uh, it's a continuing, continuing struggle between these young uh, men 
uh, maybe 20 years old and even 17 years old, uh, actually they are teenagers. So there is mm, struggle between them and policemen. They are shooting each other and so on. But uh, there is parallel life with weddings and bathings and it was very interesting for me to write my first uh, piece of fiction about my native region. And uh, two years ago, I sent my manuscript about uh, today's Pakistani life uh, uh, to the competition of the debut prize under male pseudonym. And uh, this prose is, um, this long story is published in the collection of stories called Square of the Circle under my yes. male pseudonym. And um, my real personality was revealed only during awarding ceremony. And it was a sort of literary tricks and I really was surprised when it uh, did succeed, succeeded, and um, even Olga was deluded that I'm a young, uh, brutal man from Caucasus writing something. <laughs> well, she was for a while. Olga apparently caught on slightly earlier than 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 Alisa actually thought, apparently. And once, when shortlist was announced, uh, I met one of uh, the famous Russian writers uh, who was in the debut jury, and he asked me. Well, you know, there is rather talented young man from from your native republic. Do you know him? Uh, do you meet him? Or maybe you, do you communi communicate with him? And I told him that yes, we sometimes write each other letters. And, so on. and he asked, "Well, is he handsome?" <laughs> and I answered, "Maybe he is. I can say that he is handsome." <laughs> Anyway, this is this is this was a great story. She actually she she was able to hide this, and really nobody except Ulga knew this until the ceremony itself. And they were expecting some some you know you, you can imagine what they were. They weren't expecting this. And when she walked up, it was a big it was a there was in the end. Um, you can ask her how people reacted to that. The one reaction which I which I which I really loved was the uh, the same member of the jury who asked her that question. Later on, how could I not tell that, that was written by a woman? They think that they should be able to tell that, right, for the style of writing and killing yourself about that. But anyway, that was, that's a great story. Uh, Eden? Hi, I'm Igor Savelev. I'm uh, from uh, Ufa. It's a um, uh, big industrial city. Can, can, sorry, can you hear back there? Not can really. you hear in the back? Not really. Not really. Okay. <clears throat> I'm Igor Savelev. Hi, uh, I'm from... Uh, Ufa, it's a big industrial city in Ural, uh, between Ural and Volga region. I'm a journalist, uh, prose writer, and literature critic. Um, I work in newspaper. I'm a crime reporter, uh, but uh, in my short novels, uh, I don't uh, write about crime. It is uh, not interesting for me. Uh, I write about uh, young people, about uh, my generation, and uh, okay. No, <laughs> <still>. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And, again, any more? There'll be question and answers. <coughs> Irina. My name is Irina Bogdirova. Uh, I was born in Kazan. It is a Tatarstan uh, on the Volga, and uh, I grew up in uh, Ulyanovsk. Uh, it is the city where uh, Lenin was born. Um, I am a prose writer. Uh, I have uh, two books now. My, uh, my new book was published uh, in the end of uh, last, uh, last year. Uh, I write about uh, people of my age, uh, about the um, wishes and searches and uh, so on. And uh, one of my uh, novel, uh, my first novel, uh, which was uh, in the book, uh, in the uh, the uh, debut prize uh, is uh, in this book. Uh, it is called uh, mm -hmm, The Beaten Trap. It is about hitchhikers uh, in Russia. <laughs> so. and, and this thing about it, actually, uh, I should mention that the book which made uh, Igor relatively famous in Russia was called Pale City. It's also in this collection, and it's also at hitchhiking. There's a hitchhiking subculture for the youth. Um, and these things become particularly important at a generational at a time of general, generational change like this, because they need places where they're going to go, where they're going to be separated from the parents' generation, where they, their life is going to be sort of established as the as the center for um, the the world that they're living in. So, um, John, one second. Yeah. Just 
if there are people having trouble hearing, there are some seats in the front row, and I welcome you to come down. Yeah, we'd love to see you. Do. Um, so then, what I think we'll do then is let's 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 get into the readings then right away, and um, as soon as we finish the readings, we can go into question and answer. There's a lot of interesting things to to tell. Um, the so the story is called Salam Dalgat. Salam is uh, the sort of greetings, and Dalgat is the name of a young man who moves about the town, and he meets different uh, people and witnesses different happenings. Um, there are lots of conversations in the Dagestan version of Russian language with different local expressions and so on. And this is one of the scenes during wedding ceremony. So the point is that it, it, it's a way of giving, would this be correct? It's a way of giving a sort of a, a complete and varied picture of various aspects of life in Mahachkala, the, the capital of, of, of Dagestan. And and so what we we to give you a flavor of it, we've chosen one episode and sort of shortened it to give to give you uh, something of, of of a bit of the plot line. You have a sense of how it works. Um, all of these are excerpts, and sometimes they're shortened when you when we needed to sort of s spread out around the story to give you a sense of how it works. Um, Адимир, вот скажи мне, Лей земляк, не знаешь, что сказать, да? Спросил грузный мужчина Долгата, не слушая косноязычного томату. Не знаю, отвечал Долгат, подцепляя масляное чудо. Бардак же кругом, кругом бардак, качал головой мужчина. Из динамиков уже несся голос Адимира. Loud rustling sounds came from huge loudspeakers by the wall. And then an accented, unsure sounding voice spoke up hoarsely. And now, dear friends, relatives and guests, I give the floor to a very fine and respected man who er, has achieved so much in his life, knows no bounds when caring for family, and helps them in everything they do. And today, as the hearts of our dear Kamal and Amina are united, he will say some er, parting words to them. Listen closely, Kamal. You'll get a chance to speak later, after our dear Idemir advises you how to proceed in your future family life. So, Idemir, what do you want to tell us? You're at a loss for words, aren't you? The burly man said to Dalgat, ignoring the false, faltering utterances of the master of ceremonies. Uh, do, I don't know, said Dalgat, impl impaling a greasy chudu on his fork. This is a mess, just a mess, the man said, shaking his head as the voice of Idemir issued from the loudspeakers. Сегодня соединяются сердца представителей двух народов, двух великих народов Дагестана, вдохновенно и с пафосом говорил голос, Аварского и Лакского. Мы очень рады, что наш Камал, которого я еще помню вот в таком возрасте, теперь такой джиги, орел, и что он женится на самой красивой девушке Амине из знаменитого аула Цавкра. Весь мир знает канатоходцев из аула Цавкра, и я желаю Камалу, чтобы со своей женой ему было легче, чем канатоходцу на Ханате. Давайте выпьем за эту новую семью. Пожелаем, чтобы у Камала и Амины родилось 10 детей, и все радовали своих родителей. Адимир, видимо, поднял бокал, так что все мужчины встали. Долгат тоже поднялся и прикупил для вида. Today, today we see united the hearts of representatives of two peoples, two great peoples of Dagestan, the Avars and the Lachs, said the voice, laden with a mix of inspiration and pathos. We are overjoyed that our Kamal, who I remember when he was so high, has grown into such a horseman, an eagle of a man, and that he has wed this most beautiful girl, Amina, from the village of Tsovkar, so celebrated for its tightrope walkers. I wish Kamal that his life with her will be much easier than treading a tightrope. So let's drink to this new family. May Kamal and Amina have ten children and that all are a joy to their parents. Idemir had evidently raised his glass as all the men now stood up. 
Dalgat also sipped at his vodka for appearance's sake, and once they were seated, the burly man again turned to him. Когда снова уселись, грузный мужчина опять обратился к Долгату. Я вот этими руками всю жизнь что-то делаю, пожаловался Сайпудин. И все просто так уходит. Туда отдай, сюда отдай, в школе учителю отдай, в УЗИ за сессию отдай. Дом же есть, никак не построить. 20 лет строю. Теперь сына на работу устраивает, надо деньги собирать. Жене говорю, цепочку продавай. Жениться будет, как свадьбу мы сделаем. Красть придется. Okay, so once they were seated, the burly man again turned to him. My whole life I worked with my hands, he lamented, and everything gets spent somehow. Pay for this, pay for that. I have to give the teacher, the teacher something at school, cough up for the college exams. I've got a house, and I can't finish it. I've been building it for 20 years, but now I'm supposed to find money to fix my son up with a job. I even told the wife that she has to sell her, sell her gold necklace. He'll want to get married. But how are we supposed to pay for a wedding? It's going to have to be theft. Что красть, спросил Долгар. Невесту, да, воскликнул Сайпудин. Тогда банкет собирать не надо. Просто мага сделаем и все. Нет, плохо жену красть, это чеченцы крадут. А мы не крадем, нет, вмешался седой мужчина, сидевший напротив. Долгат обратил внимание, что у него на голове, несмотря на жару, высится каракулевая шапка. What, what are you going to steal? asked Долгат. A bride for him! Сайпудин explained. Then there won't be any need to throw a bank, but you just do the marriage ceremony and that's all. No. Bride stealing is bad. The Chechens do that, not us, interrupted a gray-haired man sitting opposite them, who, despite the heat, wore a tall Astrakhan fur hat. Вах, Долгат, ты что здесь сидишь? Танцевать идем. К Долгату нагнулся троюродный брат, белозубый, с умными глазами. Привет, Малик, обрадовался Долгат, поспешно вставая с места. Иду, и иду. Малик с друзьями успели тихонько умыкнуть жениха. Невеста, как и принято, сидела с кислым лицом, а Долгат продолжал выискивать Халилбека. Okay. Um, Dalgat, why are you just sitting here? We're off to dance, said a second cousin of his, who suddenly leaned over his shoulder, all wise-eyed and white-toothed. Hello, Malik, I'm coming, said Dalgat in relief, springing from his chair. Malik and his friends managed to pull off the wedding ritual, discreetly capped, kidnapping the groom, while the bride affected a playful look of dismay. But Dalgat, con Dalgat continued to look for Khalil Bek. There were Idemir Khalil Bek, and the groom's father, Zalbek, and some important guest, guest officials or other. Uncle Magomed clapped Dalgat on the shoulder. Ask Abdullah's daughter, Madina, to dance. She's sitting right there, see, next to my mother, said Magomed, pointing at the neat, neatly coiffed girl. Go, when the music starts. Dalgat shied away. I, I need to speak, I need to talk to Khalil Bek, he told Magomed. You'll have your talk later, don't muck, muck me about. Go and ask her when the music begins. The master of ceremonies took the micro microphone and resumed his faltering spiel. Hello, anyone out there? Right, right. So basically, our groom has been stolen. Why is the bride sitting alone, eh? A group of us have already gone to look for him. And we will er, sort out those friends of his who did this. That's right. Even you, Khalil Bek. I now give the floor to our esteemed Khalil Bek, who found the time to attend the wedding of his close relative Zalbek, who is marrying his son to pretty Amina from Tsofkra. And without further ado, Halilbek will say a few words and share some of his wisdom. Salam, Dalgat, came a voice behind him. And Dalgat turned to see his cousin, Mur cousin Murad, sh unshaven and tired looking. Let's go outside and talk. What happened? Dalgat asked. I need your help. Suddenly, Halilbek's voice was interrupted by women's screams and the singer singer's Music cut in momentarily. People standing in the street ran upstairs to investigate, and Dalgat also raced up into the hall, where he saw a sea of shocked faces, especially that of the master of ceremonies, as he held back Zalbeg from a gr crowd of men crouching over something on the floor. Someone shouted for an ambulance. What happened, Dalgat asked the nearest guests, but they just clutched their heads. Vahi, vahi, the old women shrieked, covering their mouths with scarves and looking fearfully at the Malay. Someone shot Idemir, said a shaggy-haired young man, his eyes bulging. I swear someone shot him. I saw it with my own eyes. He was standing there and suddenly from out of nowhere got a bullet in the head. This side of the hall is open. You could shoot from anywhere, said another voice. Someone led the bride in her billowy skirt from her table without letting her look around, while Saipudin blundered past Dalgat, spluttering as he went. God have mercy on us, simpered the girls, as they poured out of the hall in an, or in an ornately dressed throng. Uh, you can. No. <clears throat> uh,
язык переведены моя повесть «Бледный город», о которой говорил Джун, и небольшой рассказ, который в переводе называется «Мода Грейн Пастора». In uh, two of his works have been translated into English, uh, Pale City, which I mentioned before, which is actually in this collection, and a shorter work, a story called Modern Day Pastoral, which is in this collection. Я прочту начало из последнего рассказа. So what we're going to read is the first two short parts of this story, the Modern Day Pastoral, in the Square of the Circle collection. 17 апреля 2005 года министр путей сообщения издал приказ со скрипом на прошедший Минюст о разрешении проезда граждан на третьей багажной полке по откатным вагонам. Либеральная общественность пыталась возмутиться, как и всему в тот год, но против факта не поплешь. Но нет у людей денег на полноценный подкат, не по шпалам же. Жесткая же полка вплотную под потолком, без белья, без поручни, без всего стоила копейки. On the 17th of April 2005, the Minister of Communications issued a decree, grudgingly passed by the Ministry of Justice, allowing people to travel on the third shelf, that is, the luggage rack, of communal train carriages. Liberal-minded citizens were up in arms, as they were about most things that year. But you couldn't argue with the facts. People, people simply couldn't afford full-place rail tickets. And what are they going to go on? What are they going to walk along the rail lines? The third shelf was hard and uncomfortable, right up under the ceiling, with no bed linen, no handrail, nothing. But the tickets cost next, next to nothing, too. Вот вы сами смогли бы туда забраться, спросили министра, типового номенклатурного кабанчика, журналисты со всеми извительными в тот год. Но и кабанчик без комплексов сам рассмеялся. Нет, да мне не надо, а вот молодежь у нас без денег сидит, не съездит никуда. Вот для них-то лишний раз подпрыгнуть, подтянуться, разве проблема? So, you think you, could, you think you could climb up there yourself? The journalist asked the minister, a typical hog-like bureaucrat. They seemed to have it in for everyone that year. But he was a down-to-earth type and just laughed it off. No, but thank God I don't have to. The young people, though, they don't have any money. They can't afford to go anywhere. And it, it's not going to be hard for them to climb up and down, right? Um, okay. Three days before... Part, that's part one. Part two. Three days before the trip, Elena experienced her first kiss... Her girlish, her girlish innocence was well and truly shaken and stirred. What about the train journey? Nope, no big deal. She would cope. The thing was, Ellie didn't like trains. The stuffiness, the threadbare sheets, the obligatory sweaty, sweaty traveling companions. Last summer she had gone to the seaside with her parents. Now you see how, how old-fashioned she still was. It was torture. <laughs> what she had found particularly repellent was all those naked legs hanging down from the upper bunks, dangling in the aisles. They were ugly, old, and callous. You had to look where you were walking. You might find someone's foot in your face. Ugh, disgusting. But on the way back, testimony to the miracles of seawater. The same legs were beautiful, clean, and youthful. This time, there was no sea, and the summer was essentially over. But it was still an adventure. Ellie was trembling with happiness, although she kept telling herself, it might fall through, it might fall through. She had, she had told her parents, her doting, touchingly clueless parents, the first lie that came into her head, something about a friend in the city of Samara. Which friend is that then? Oh, Dad, you know, the, we, we met at the seaside last year. His name, was, his name was Martin. Well, it was really Marat, but that wasn't really nearly as interesting. When a boy lets his hair grow rather than messing about with it, it's just gorgeous. His striking features and wide-set eyes it was the first time it had happened to Ellie, and she was totally smitten. He was into live-action role-playing games and spent about two hours hard-selling the techniques of the movement to her, stressing the emotional involvement and how it was more than just waving wooden sticks about. She didn't need any convincing. She would have readily bought into any interest he might have had. Would she go with him to the role-players convention in the far-off town of Vensk? In a heartbeat. <laughs> to be honest, she would have done anything for him. Anything. But hang on, don't get carried away. You're not his girlfriend yet. Anyway, he, be he believes in free love. He already said so. Have you ever traveled on the third shelf, he asked? No, you're, you're not supposed to, are you? Well, they just changed the rules, so you can now. It's really cheap. We've done it, we've done it a couple of times. You just need to learn how to hold on. It's easy, I'll show you. Look. Ah! Calm down, it can't be that bad. And she, she, and she smiled a pale smile to herself. Whatever it takes. <laughs> Eating the...
А, ну окей, вот тебе. Давайте, давайте, давайте. Ну, надо сказать какие-то слова э, перед тем, как начать читать. Я хочу сказать, что э, по образованию я истор, я окончил исторический факультет, поэтому исторические темы меня очень интересуют. A few words before we begin about this story. And, uh, Dmitry himself is a, historic, a historian by training, and so historical issues are of particular interest to him. Но в литературе, наверное, больше внимания я уделяю тому, как история воспринимается в современности, воспринимается на нашем молодом поколении. But in literature, what particularly interests him is how that history is perceived by people, and particularly by the people of his own generation. И вот э, отрывки из рассказа, которые я сейчас э, прочитаю, как раз э, посвящены именно этой проблеме. And uh, the, the excerpt from the story that we're going to be reading now is dedicated specifically that, that theme. Давайте я сейчас скажу немного о том, как сократить и что такое. Да. The, um, this is one of the, uh, with the story we just read with, with Igor, you could see it's just the beginning of the story, which we could take as, as, as a chunk of that works. The structure of Mithri's story makes that impossible. So what we had to do was, uh, instead of taking, leaving out the end, we had to sort of leave out stuff in the middle. So it's, it's more of an abridgment than, a, uh, than an excerpt, just so you know. And you can sort of sense, I think, how it works and how it might be filled in. Okay. Uh, the story is called Uritsky Street. <coughs> Петр Андреевич писал стихи, писал рифмой мечты и цветы, розы и слезы. Он нигде не пытался публиковать свои, свои верши, прекрасно понимая их не, незрелость. Тем не менее, Петр Андреевич относился с некоторой долей презрения к тем, кто стихов не пишет. Вау, ученики, куда им? Презрительно ворчал. Петр Андреевич, несмотря на то, что он и сам, по большому счету, был лавочником. Но он был лавочником непростым. Петр Андреевич был аптекарь. Это же почти врач, лекарь, самое достойное из существующих ремесел. Петр Андреевич wrote poetry with rhymes like showers and flowers, tears and fears. He made no effort to publish his verses, knowing full well how immature they were. Still, Pyotr Andreevich did look down on someone on people who didn't write poetry. Nothing but shopkeepers, what do you want from them? growled Pyotr Andreevich with scorn, although he himself, strictly speaking, was a shopkeeper. But he wasn't just any kind of shopkeeper, he was a pharmacist. And a pharmacist, that was almost a doctor, a healer, the noblest profession of them all. <coughs> Прикладывая, переставляя коробочки, баночки и колбочки с таблетками и миксурами, в воображении Петра Андреевича, то и дело возникали картины в выспрянных миров, где начисто отсутствуют так опостылившие ему повседневность. Но Петр Андреевич был человеком очень аккуратным, усидчивым и, и внимательным. Еще не бывало такого случая, чтобы он ошибся хотя бы на копейку в своих, э, в своих сметах, чтобы он потерял или просто перепутал какие-нибудь фармацевтические препараты. Each evening, as he was scrupulously double-checking receipts and expenses, distributing and rearranging his little job, boxes, jars and beakers with their tablets and liquids, in Pyotr Andreevich's imagination would arise lofty vistas in which, which there was no trace of the workaday world with which he was so thoroughly disillusioned. What Pyotr Andreevich was a very meticulous, patient, and careful man, and he had yet to err by so much as a kopeck in his accounting, or to misplace or misidentify a single pharmaceutical preparation. He thought, what we're doing at the beginning, as you can see, the parallel reading, so you get a sense of, of the sound of the Russian, but for time's sake, so you have more of a chance to talk to them, then I'm just going to read out the rest of them. Um, he thought things would go on like that forever, but, it, but already several years had pass, passed since everything had changed. First the war began, the death of some royal personage from a foreign country in some provincial city of that same foreign country, none of which had any particular importance for Pyotr Andreevich, became the drop that overflowed the cup of contradictions in the realm of the great and powerful of the world. 
Soon the war itself became the drop that overflowed in its turn, the cup of political contradictions in his own country. In February, the Tsar abdicated, and in October a new government arose that turned the customary way of life topsy-turvy, or more accurately, abolished it outright. Notwithstanding all that, Pyotr Andreich wrote his poetry. Had the poetry changed? On the one hand, the rhymes weren't any less feeble, and the lines still didn't always fit the meter. On the other, though, Pyotr Andreich had himself changed enormously over the previous year. The man he had, he had so recently been now seemed like a child to him, although Pyotr Andreich was almost 50. It was a strange time. More strange than terrible, actually. Of course, he had to fear the bullets, the faces of the armed men, wild and full of hatred for everything around them. But it turned out you could grow accustomed e even to that. Next part. Igor had only just graduated from the university and gone to work at a pretty good job to judge by the salary. Naturally, no one had any use for the things he had spent the previous five years learning. Palatalization and the reduction of certain sounds in the old Slavic language, the varieties of verbal Im imagery and literature, the themes in the works of Sophocles, Dante, and Nabokov. None of that was of the slightest interest to his employers. A sales manager for construction materials required a somewhat different brand of knowledge. <laughs> Having said that, mastering that knowledge had presented no particular challenge for Igor. It was all intolerably boring, but Igor, gritting his teeth, told himself that he could do what he loved in his spare time, that the main thing was to do it without starving. He was really only afraid his interests might narrow, ultimately confining themselves to brands of cement and varieties of siding. Yes, back at the university, his teachers had taken note of his unconventional way of thinking, his passion for his subject. They had said that Igor would go far. He hadn't, though. Soon, Igor had reached the point where he was, where he was able to fly the parental nest and take a one-bedroom apartment. Picking up the keys from, from the landlord, he set off for his new abode. He quickly located the building marked number such and such, Uritsky Street. He entered the building, went up to his floor, and turned the key in the lock. I should have said, we should have said at the beginning, Uritsky was the first leader of the Chika, what became the KGB later on. This is important. Next part. They came down early in the morning. Pyotr Andreich was still asleep. The men in gray overcoats kicked the door down, dragged him out of bed, and led him outside, still, und still undressed. They took him to an office somewhere where he sat for a long time, waiting for the head of the institution, whom Pyotr Andreich began to think of, in the language of the old days, as the department chief. Finally, he came. So the good times are over, huh? The, the department chief shouted right in Pyotr Andreich's face. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand, muttered, muttered Pyotr Andreich. What's to not quite understand, the department chief inter interrupted him. He was a relatively young man with curly hair, and he hid his shifty eyes behind the round lenses of his glasses. Why have I been brought here? I haven't done anything. Haven't done anything! Again, he didn't let Pyotr Andreich talk. Tell me, my dear fellow, what do you do? I, 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 I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, ph I'm a ph pharmacist managed Pyotr Andreich, stuttering the words out. It turned out to be harder for him to pronounce those few words than to drag a huge crate of medicines from one place to another. Yes, it was literally a physical exertion. And having named his profession, Pyotr Andreich might have collapsed to the floor, out of breath and exhausted. No, my dear fellow, screeched the man across the table. Let us put it more directly. You are a private entrepreneur. And you know what a private, what that is, a private entrepreneur? You're a foreign element to the proletariat. The department had sat down and smoked a cigarette. While the arrested pharmacist, the foreign element to the Victorian, victorious class, stood where he was, he was left standing there for at least two hours more. His legs began to go numb and his consciousness went dim <coughs> from the questions that were repeated again and again, but remained so very meaningless to it. Last part. A disturbing dream came to Igor. At first, in the mornings, he couldn't remember what, it, what happened to them, but he always woke up in a cold, cold sweat. Today was one of those days. For some reason, Igor was nervous. He kept forgetting all sorts of little things, and nothing he did seemed to turn out right, so that at the end, he earned himself a reprimand by his superiors. Eventually, though, the plot of his dream began to grow clearer. He came home that evening, but somehow there was none of that comforting, cozy feeling he had been anticipating. Mitya, his neighbor, rang the doorbell and burst into Igor's department, a bottle in his fist. Mitya had already begun celebrating something. Even he didn't know what. 
And his arrival at Eagle's Place was supposed to put the final touch on the end of the work week. He was animated, he was always that way, when he had heard a new joke and needed to tell it at once to all his friends. Imagine this, eager old buddy, I saw this, this commercial on TV, it was about exercise equipment and crap like that, so they had all this stuff, and the warehouse house, it was in the city of Kazan, on Uritsky Street. Switch the cities, and you could walk over and pick up your purchase, it'd be great. Mitya knocked back his shot glass full of vodka and chugged some juice from the, right from the carton to wash it down. It's, it's past time we did away with the cities completely, said Igor with a groan. Everywhere, the same streets, the same people, the same buildings. And anyway, Igor continued, isn't it an insult to our history that we pronounce these names every day? Without thinking anything of it, we say Uritsky Street or Dzerzhinsky Pro Pros Prospect. Without stopping to think about the names, without considering what it is we've just said, Igor was obviously talking to the empty space before him. Mitya was entirely incapable of grasp, grasping those notions. What do you give a damn? So long as the bus stops close and they clear the snow in winter, what's the difference if they call it Joe Schmo Street? No, Mitya, it matters. The thing is, you see, I've been having the same dream every night. What's the dream about? Well, it's nothing. It's, it's about this pharmacist. And now, it is a book video. I'm going to read uh, an extract from. Uh, Gromche, Gromche, Gromche. I'm going to read an extract okay. from my short story. Uh, it is about a girl who was. Uh, it is about the uh, hitchhike too, and it is about a girl who was picked up by a uh, boy, track, track driver. Oh, yeah, long distance yeah, truck driver, right. Uh, and, and we will see what uh, happened after that. Джон, мы читаем как первый раз. Ну, то, что как первый раз. Все. Его звали Владик. Он был не только разговорчив, но и любвеобилен. Через час резды он сообщил мне, что хочет со мной поговоркаться. Я удивилась немало и даже не поведала, что он не шутит. Я была к тому моменту уже пять дней на трассе и месяц как увольно путешествует по стране. Не скажу, чтобы от меня воняло, но костром прокопился успел упорядочно. На дорогу я всегда одевалась так, что сразу не поймешь, кто голосует, парень или девица. А главное, в мытарствах я сама всегда забывала, какого я пола и вообще, что такое женская привлекательность. Лето? Это дороги, походы, горы, солнце, дикость, одиночество и автостоп. Я – бесполое лохматое чудище под рюкзаком с себя ростом. Секса – ноль. Мой драйвер заставил меня пять минут истерических охотать. It's called the seizure. His name was Vlad, and he was not only talkative, but he was a very loving fellow. About an hour into the drive, he announced that he fancied a roll in the sack with me. <laughs> This came as a considerable, considerable surprise, and I was fairly sure he must be drunk, joking because by this time I had been roaming freely around the country for about for a month, and I had now been on the road for five days straight. I won't say that I was reeking, but I had been thoroughly smoked by the campfires. The way I dressed on the road, you could hardly tell whether it was a guy or a girl hitching a ride. More to the point, in my tribulations, I would myself invariably, invariably forget what sex I was and anything relating to feminine allure. Summer was about the road, hiking, mountains, sun, barbarity, solitude, and hitchhiking. I was an unkempt asexual freak bearing a backpack as big as myself. Zero sexuality. My trucker's proposition had me laughing hysterical for a full five minutes. No, he was serious, and I had to turn all my thoughts into a lie, so that he would be convinced that he was wrong as an object of love. Мысль о том, чтобы попробовать покинуть машину, меня не посетила. Коней на переправе, как известно, стараются не менять. А мой драйвер оказался упрямым тяжеловозом. Упорно он доказывал, что я не прогадаю. Except he was, except he was serious. And I had to employ all my rhetorical skills to persuade him that he was deluded in seeing me as an appropriate object for his lascivious attentions. It never entered my mind to get out of the truck. Everyone knows you don't change horses in midstream. But my driver proved an obstinate nag and stubbornly continued to persuade me that I would not be disappointed. We thought you were. All right. I've got a boyfriend, I said, searching for a straightforward human excuse. What, the pretty boy, the one standing ahead of you? You call that a boyfriend? He's never going to show you a good time. You don't know what love is, kid. What you need is a real man. I make it a principle not to do it on the road. Well, what do you think, there's something wrong with me? We'll turn off the highway this evening and find a place to get it on. He had a huge belly, although he was hardly old. I stared at him wondering. He was just tenacious. 
The good roadside tarts have died out, he lamented. The whole way from Nizhny Novgorod, I didn't see a single decent one. Either they're like almost little schoolgirls, or they're all ladies already, pushing 50. What happened to the good ones? Do they all get, what do they all get, go get married? And me, what am I, a pervert or something that I should go for these? I snuck a glance at myself in the side mirror. A freckled, snub-nosed face, almost like an anime cartoon, looked back at me, wild-eyed with dirty matted hair, a face that could barely be twenty, although I was older than that. What could he be seeing in me? I looked away from the mirror with a sigh. What is it? You don't like me? Vlad asked without turning to me. I, I like you fine, as, as a person. Well, well, great, let's do it! No, it's precisely because I do like you that we're not going to do it. I, I don't get it. I, I, don't, I don't want to wreck your life. What does that mean? It means what I said. I'm a witch. And it's dangerous to sleep with me, I blurted out. Now it was his turn to laugh, as if, devil, as if demons were tickling his armpits. He lost his grip on the steering wheel and practically swerved into the oncoming lane. I sat beside him with a grave and sullen look. Come on, kid, that's, it's a bit much. It's, this isn't my first day behind the wheel. It's not my first day on the road either, gramps. Well, go on, prove it. What proof do you want? Well, okay, witch. What can you do? Oh, just little things. I, I can cure things. Colds, family spats, various things. Nothing too difficult, I faltered. I thought he might let it drop, of course. And of course, I didn't say a word about the weird, cruel gift. The thing that suppressed me all my life. That gave me nightmares and headaches and made me so screwed up and difficult. Can you put the evil eye on someone, he asked. Stop coming on to me and I won't put it on you. <laughs> Nah, I don't believe it. It's a load of crap. Go on, show me something. What am I supposed to show you? No, I didn't mean a striptease. I mean, sh show me something you can do. I scrutinized him for a moment and then let myself go. I started telling him about his life, that he had a jealous wife, that he didn't love her, and that she was always going on at him about not earning enough. I told him he had piles and gastritis and a chronic cold. I told him that he had a, a five-year-old son that he loved and sometimes took with him on shorter trips. I told him his elder brother had been killed two years before in a head-on collision while drunk behind the wheel, and that his boss at the depot where he worked wanted to fire him, but that he shouldn't worry about it. Even if he did get fired, he'd get a better job with more money within a, within a couple of weeks, and everything would work out, unless, of course, he touched me now. <laughs> I don't know what startled him the most, but half an hour later, he was still set, sitting there as white as a sheet, sweating worse than in the summer heat. He kept repeating a single obscene word, time after time, thoughtfully, drawing it out, almost chanting it. I could see the state he was in. It scared me, and I kept, and I kept very quiet. After all, he was the one behind the wheel, and as they say, the devil is always at your elbow. But what had I told him anyway? All those ailments just go with the territory of being a, a long-distance truck, dri truck driver. The only one I had left out was rheumatoid arthritis and something in the joints because for the moment I couldn't remember what they were called. He had told me about his wife himself and the fact that he was obsessed with anything in a skirt made it clear that there were problems at home. His son's toy Kamaz truck was in the cab with us and his little baseball cap was tucked in behind the vi sun visor. I guessed the kid's age from its size. He had been grumbling about difficulties with his boss, and I just made up the bit about his future prospects to lighten the rest of it, and to encourage him to think positively, as the psychic on television when I was a kid was always saying. The bit about the brother was my only slip, coming from the cruel power I was born with. Well, well, Christ, I mean, just, holy crap. What are you, you advertise in the papers? I bring my friends to you. Oh, come on, that, that's just peanuts. I was pleased. It looked like I could relax. There'd be no more, there'd be, that there'd be no more about sessions in the sack. Alas, his sexual, his sexual imagination found itself a new avenue to pursue. Hey, I heard that if you sleep with a witch, you won't have any more problems in your life. Is that right? <laughs> Vlad, where are you getting this bunk from? Everything has to be by mutual consent or else... Okay, okay, I got it. I'm shutting up now. Listen. Never had a witch. <laughs> What's it like with a witch? <laughs> it's finally it's Olga's turn.
голосом Джона. With, with, with a, by means of my voice, through my voice. Uh, прочту отрывок из документального рассказа, посвященного моему отцу. Рассказ называется «Мой отец инопланетянин». Is, she's going, we're going to read excerpts from a story that Olga's written not long ago. It's a documentary or autobiographical story about her father. Uh, and it's called My Father Was an Alien. Мой отец Егоров Александр Германович до конца своей жизни не верил, что не полетит в космос. Вероятно, это было сродни антинаучной вере в земное физическое бессмертие. Тем не менее, мой папа умер 8 сентября 2002 года. My father, Alexander Yegorov, to his dying day refused to believe that he wasn't going to outer space. It was probably a kind of anti-scientific faith, scientific faith in an earthly, physical immortality. Despite that, my father died on September 8, 2002. In my passport, it means that I was born in Sverdlovsk. In fact, it's not true. Свердловск, подобно фантастической планете, был окружен спутниками-невидимками, засекреченными городками, у которых вместо названий имелись только номера. Что-то произошло в одном из этих городков в самом конце 50 -х. Что именно рассказывали около. My passport indicates that I was born in the city of Свердловск, but it isn't really true. Свердловск, like some fantastical planet, is surrounded by invis invisible satellites, secret closed towns with only numbers instead of names. Something happened in one of those towns toward the very end of the, f of the 50s, but they would only talk around what it actually was. Якобы в лесу, куда обычно ходили по грибы, вырастали большие, как непропеченные караваи, пятнистые подберезовики, а в окрестных деревнях рождались двуголовые телята. Одна голова нормальная, Другая маленькая и лысая, как детский кулачок. Сам городок оставался пепельно-белым пятном. Из него мои родители сбежали, будто из тюрьмы, потому что уволиться просто так было невозможно. In the forest where we used to pick mushrooms, they said, the brown-capped ones now grew spotted and huge, like big round loaves of bread baked only halfway through.